Hello, here we are again. I want to tell you a little bit about the past now, because ever since the 1970s, when we went to the moon, in 1961, President Kennedy made this, this moonshot of going to the moon, and he didn't know how, he really didn't know how. They were already in space, but he wanted to land on the moon. And he said, okay, in 10 years time, we're gonna do it. And that's when it all started. So we went to the moon, we made these steps. Um, and then the whole environmental movement started. It started with um, Silent Spring, Rachel Carson. It started with um, many of the others in systemic design, Donella Meadows, Dennis Meadows, uh, all these people of the living systems. But it even started much earlier because before Descartes, and before Newton, there was a strong connection to nature by the Greeks, by Leonardo da Vinci, by Goethe. But back then, you still had polymath who understood about better sciences and planet and nature. But they also understood about societies and about human nature and about and I think a lot of these things have been so uh, so flattened and superficial and that we don't know what what anymore. So at this moment, the buzzword is regenerative, whatever that means. Because in better sciences, regenerative and synergy and syntropy and Entropy, it all means something else, let me put it like that. And a lot of the economics and the alpha people, the cultures people, the language people, they run away with terms and they, well, they don't know math, so they don't understand the full spectrum. And that's not a problem. We can explain it, but don't think it's new. And don't think we haven't done a lot already because we're building upon each other. So let me do a little presentation. Again, um, let me see, where do I have it? Share screen. Yes. Abundance for All is a think tank with a lot of scientists. And we are a spin-off of the Blue Economy, which is the think tank from the last century, Ziri. From Deep Ecology to Blue Economy, Gunter Pauli, um, Entrepreneurial Economy, and it is zero emissions research initiatives. We build on his legacy. We built on Janine Banuas's legacy in a biomimicry. We build on all the people who have understood what it was like when they saw the planet from a distance. And seeing the planet from a distance is what is maybe the best gain from the moment that we went into space. So we saw the blue marble, we started to care for her, and then chaos theory ended up in Gaia theory, and we know she's a self-regulating organism, so that's also why you shouldn't worry too much if you have too much plastics in the ocean, in the end, evolution will take care of it. But of course it takes time. So we should be smart beings. We called ourselves homo sapiens. So we are wise 
people. Let's be that. Um, since last century, a lot of economies have been evolving. And of course, there was this huge part of globalization and, um, well, not so very smart material sciences. But we also had a lot of principles of local economies, local vibrant economies. And in the UK, you see that. Um, in the 1920s, it's already started in the south of the UK, around Totnes, there's a huge vibrant regenerative economy around the glass industry. And also there you have Schumacher College, which is a wonderful college of math and magic and planet and nature and really understanding what it is all about. Um, but also we have a lot of other European places where it happened. Not only European places, I must say. There is also in South America, there is Las Javiotas, which is in Colombia, which is a wonderful local economy um, using the scope and the nature and everything with all kinds of sciences to make it vibrant and economy, economically viable and also a growing economy <laughs> because you just need local resources for that and make sure you have lots of transactions and vibrancy in the system and then you have a growing economy. It's not so hard to build a growing economy. So um, in Europe, we have Aliero as a very good example. My dear friend, Javier Morales, uh, is the big leader there. He's a wonderful leader, a really regenerative leader. And he's been building this since also the last century because they needed to get away from their island. They, the Spanish, it is a Spanish island. It's the smallest Canary Island. And the Spanish said, well, let's um, close down the island. It has 500 volcanoes. And it said, well, let's make just a science center out of it and not have any people on it anymore. And then the local people, they protested and they said, no, we want an economy on our island and they made an economy on their island. And it's a very vibrant, very good economy, full of a lot of uh, cooperatives. Spanish culture knows cooperatives very well. So they have a lot of cooperatives there and they use everything they have to create a lot of value in the system. How did they do it? They first made a vision for the island they said, what is it we want to be? And then they decided it's not just the concrete building industry they want. They wanted to be uh, an ecotourism island and uh, uh, an agroeconomic island. So they want to do agroeconomics, um, farming, uh, sea farming, land farming, um, and all the processes that belong with it. So they do grapes, they do pineapples, they have prize winning wines, they have huge, wonderful restaurants and yeah, tourism on the island. But they also made sure that you cannot fly directly to the island from Spain. So you have to make a, a, an extra stop in Tenerife or in Las Palmas so that you will not get the mass tourism because that'll wreck everything. Um, in the sea, they cordoned off a part of the sea. Of course, they made uh, one route for all the boats so that the corals are not really spoiled uh, and destroyed. And then they cordoned off one part for uh, marine. And with that, they started uh, designing. They have a fisherman cooperation on the island and they decided they will only fish with lines 
or with bubble nets like the whales do, so they do not have any bycatch. And the rest of it is all 3D sea farming. So that's all um, growing things in the sea. Um, well, what do they do? Uh, they have local energy sources. They really designed for resilience. So they have uh, hate, uh, they have windmills and they have basins. And uh, on a design for resilience, you of course always have more local energy sources. So if one falls out, then you can do the other. So if there's more wind, then they will just uh, make sure that the water is pumped up in the uh, basin and then they let the hate do the work. When there's not enough wind, they will have water energy. They also have a lot of biodigesters, so they work with bacteria. Um, they do not smell, they really do it the biomimicry way, the blue economy way, and it's really wonderful to see how they built all this technology. They made a deal at some point with a, an electric car company. I think it was Audi to have electric cars on the island. And then they built their solar roads because we have some rules in biomimicry. And that means we do everything multifunctionally. So you need less materials. We always always do reciprocity so we feed the soil because she feeds us and we feed it with microbes and organic matter which is very important for healthy soils if you have healthy soils with um for instance terra preta which is has a, having biochar to shelter the microbes it's not a problem to have a spray sometimes if you have a pest. So we do all these combinations. We do all kinds of combinations and make it practical for farmers, make it practical for humans to really have healthy food and healthy feed, healthy fertilizers, um, fashion, we do everything. We have no dogmas. We have no dogmas here. Really, that's important. Because you can have regenerative economies on all kinds of places. So in 2020, I gave uh, lectures on Green School Bali, which is a very famous school in Indonesia. And they do a lot of things all through Indonesia and Asia to get regeneration going there. They have energy from bamboo. They have bamboo buildings. They have, uh, and they teach their children. Um, I must say it is a designer's couple who started it on Bali. They have now more schools. A lot of famous people visit there, people like Satish Kumar, but also people like uh, the UN president, like uh, Ban Ki-moon and other people. People like Richard Branson come there to finance a lot of the stuff. And a lot of rich Americans have their children there. And the children, um, they go live on the island uh, the parents and then the children learn a lot in the school about systemic design and about sea and about land and about everything, making everything productive in uh, ecologically intensified ways, nature-based solutions. And then, um, yeah, they also have, of course, the same education for the local people. So the Balinese people, the Balinese children are there too. There's lots of Balinese staff. So I gave my lectures for the staff and I hope to be back there next, uh, next spring. We go back to Asia and then we will do a lot of things there again and maybe lecture again on island economies in uh, Indonesia.
What are island economies? Regenerative design is not hard. Systemic design is not difficult. Complexity is not complicated. It needs common sense. And that means happy and healthy people in a healthy planet. That means healthy waters, healthy soils, and then design, go design a city. Go design a city on functions. If you want to cool the planet with a city, then you will use colors to cool it. You will use evaporation and plants. You can even use plants to make a city malaria low and have no, well, less diseases. You just have to look at a city with the eyes of a mosquito. Then you know you don't want still water next to humans. Then you know you don't want zoonose diseases next to humans. You need to have closed systems or you need to have not intensive farming next to people. It's silly, it's stupid, it will spread. Of course it will. You cannot limit it. You have to design for abundance. You have to design with abundance and let nature do the work. And the wonderful thing is you will have economies in which everything, the basic needs are cheap. We eat everything that's edible. So we look at the full spectrum and see, okay, what's edible? Go make oyster mushrooms on waste because oyster mushrooms love waste and they have a lot of proteins in them. So we have in Africa, we have since, since years and years and decades, we have Chido Govara and Chido really has the Future of Hope Foundation. She teaches women and children to design for resilience, to design with mushrooms and with food and with all kinds of things in cities, in rural areas, everywhere. So, dear young people, if you think we've been doing nothing, we've been working our butts off to get it all going. And the only thing you need to do is learn, understand it, combine it with computers, because please, we didn't have that in our day and age. Our models were not as good as yours about tipping points and about, about the, the keystone species in everything. And keystone species is what we can design economies with. And we have designed a lot of these island economies already. And then, of course, you can also have global economy. So you can connect them because everything in nature is interconnected and nested into each other. Happy and healthy people in a healthy planet. Bye-bye.